Hello there lovely people, it's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today I finally get to talk to you all about Splatoon 2. Yes, it's time to review this sucker, and I'm very excited. Absolutely zero waffle this time around, let's dive right into things. <laughs> Going into Splatoon 2 after the excellent first entry in the series, my expectations were really high. The original showed an incredible level of ingenuity, clever design, and almost boundless creativity, so could the sequel match up or suffer from a case of the Final Fantasy 2s? Let's find out. <laughs> First off, let's talk about the single player. Now, I've already rabbited on and on and on about it, but even so, there's lots of details that I couldn't cover before. Also, it wouldn't be very comprehensive a review if I didn't talk about all of it, so uh, yeah, let's crack on. If the original game had one significant drawback, it was the fact that although Hero Mode was good, it didn't fully stand up to the quality that the multiplayer showed. It largely felt like the developers had somewhat struggled to fully integrate the mechanics of the stellar multiplayer into a solo experience, but somehow managed to just about make it work. This result in a game mode that was enjoyable and had some incredible standout moments, but had a lack of refinement and variety in certain instances, and wasn't as long as many had hoped. Luckily, pretty much every single major complaint people had about the single player has been totally alleviated in Splatoon 2. It's still not gigantic in scope, but every level is now notably longer, larger, and has infinitely more variety. It's also much tougher as well, despite the inclusion of a more typical replenishing shield system that's so common in modern shooters. The supposedly evil Octarians have a much better AI, there are now new foes to contend with, and most importantly, they more often than not serve as an obstacle to be overcome, rather than a necessary method of progression. This in turn helps make things feel more organic, and grants the user more choice. The single player on the whole offers roughly 6 to 10 hours of content as a rough estimate, but thanks to the new weapon system, you could probably quite easily add a zero onto the end of both of those numbers. As you progress, Sheldon will gift you with a number of different weapons to use, with one of them being mandatory the first time you complete each stage. However, once you've completed a level, you can then go back and replay it with any weapon available to you. And to any Splatoon aficionado, that should be music to your ears. The weapons vary so much that playing a level with a roller and then going back to it with a charger will result in what almost feels like two different levels. I mean, it's not two different levels, but it feels like it. By playing through levels with different weapons, the game logs your progress, and should you complete a stage with every available weapon the game offers, as you, you unlock a superbly powerful Krusty Sean ticket that provides bonuses online, but more on those later. If you're even more dedicated and you play through every single level with just one of the main weapons that you unlock, you can use that in your online games. Much like the original game, they don't seem to have any different stats compared to the original standard version that they are replicating, but nevertheless, in terms of bragging rights, it's difficult to top. The only notable criticism we hold in regards to the single player is the fact that in each sector you have to find each stage in individually. This seems like a good idea on paper, but it can often be frustrating when you've got just one level to find and you don't even know where to begin searching. Thankfully though, when you've found a level, you can quickly super jump to it whenever you feel like, so it's not too bitter a pill to swallow. <laughs> Now let's move on to the brand new horde mode, if you like, Salmon Run. In this game mode, you're tasked with teaming up with a group of four and taking on wave after wave of relentless salmonids who want to fry you up into squid rings. You're not just there to lay waste, however, you're there to take out the oversized and overpowered boss salmonids and steal their golden eggs to be deposited and forwarded on to your employer, Mr. Grizz, who is basically the Nintendo equivalent of the elusive man from Mass Effect. To begin with, every wave felt fairly straightforward. The salmonids would arrive 
from somewhere on the shore, boss salmonids would show their heads, you kill them, steal their eggs, deliver them, rinse and repeat. However, shortly after rising through the ranks known as pay grades, things rapidly become more difficult. Salmonids would arrive in greater numbers unsurprisingly, but then at the start of another wave the tide would change, growing or shrinking the land mass. Then at one point fog fell, meaning it was difficult to see anything at all. Then on another wave night would fall and the enemies would be moving at double or possibly even triple the speed that they were before. It's honestly difficult to tell because I was so terrified. Salmon Run has an excellent way of lulling you into a false sense of security and then immediately changing things up to make your life ten times harder than it was. As a lover of severe challenge, this really piqued my interest and made every successful run with the salmon all the more satisfying and rewarding. Furthering the reward motif, each match will reward you with points towards your next bonus. These bonuses take various forms such as crusty Sean tickets, ability chunks, hard cash and even unique gear, meaning working for Grisco can easily give you an edge in the main multiplayer mode. There are three different ways to enjoy Salmon Run. You can match make with other random players online, band together with a group of friends over the internet, or play to your heart's content over local wireless. At first it seemed like a really weird idea to have it limited to just specific hours of specific days, but as I played more and more I can see why they've done it. It would be really easy for Salmon Run to fall into the shadow of the main online multiplayer, which is arguably better, but that's not to say that Salmon Run isn't really, really good. By limiting it like a Splatfest, it's more of an event when it happens, and so people are much more likely to sort of hop off the lobby for a bit and jump over to Grizzco to take out some Salmon Eds and that's a really good thing. It would still be nice to be able to play whenever you wanted online with friends, but maybe without getting any kind of reward, but unfortunately it's not something the game offers. <laughs> Now we're getting onto the meat, the main online modes that made Splatoon so great. Do they still hold up in Splatoon 2? Yes, they do. It's fairly well known among those that played the recent Splatfest and Test Fire demos, but those only showed a fraction of what the full game has to offer. Much remains the same as the original, but it's the small details and refinements that show how closely Nintendo has been listening to its fans. Gone are the myriad different special weapons that provide invulnerability, gone is the need to use a second screen, instead everything has been streamlined so that your focus is never away from the action. Some of the weapon changes may seem overpowered when you first hop in, such as the charger being able to hold hold its charge even when you're in squid form for a short period of time, but it's more about the levels. They've changed so much that the balancing all really happens there. There is an awful lot more cover for people to make use of, there's less verticality for the most part, with exceptions such as Moray Towers, and overall people are a little bit less aware of exactly where the entire enemy team is. This does result in levels that are arguably a little bit more vanilla and straightforward than Arowana Mall and Walleye Warehouse, but the end result is a scope of maps that do not favour any one kind of weapon, which is no mean feat. The trade-off is worth it, and although some stages aren't perhaps as iconic, they're much more suited to the hardcore, serious gameplay that Nintendo is clearly trying to push with Splatoon 2. What's more, the level rotation is now every two hours instead of every four hours, providing a much greater variety and allowing almost dangerously long play sessions to happen without becoming fatigued at the same maps and game modes repeatedly. And yes, when this rotation occurs, you will be booted from the current setup and group of people that you were with, but you then only get sent back to the lobby. You don't have to watch the news update every single time, which is a real breath of fresh air. But we do despair at the fact that you still can't change weapons between matches in regular battle without exiting the lobby, an oversight that is genuinely frustrating if only for how simple a fix it would be. Speaking of game modes, the classic three ranked modes are back yet again. Splat Zones remains essentially unchanged, but Rainmaker now sports a new kind of titular objective, which now shoots an explosive projectile rather than a giant whirlwind in the ink. It's not clear why this change was made, but it seems to work well and doesn't interfere too much with the mode's dynamic. Tower control, on the other hand, has probably changed the most, now requiring those on the tower to hold off at various checkpoints before they can progress to the final objective. This is a very welcome addition as it forces far more defensive strategies from teams rather than just attempting to charge through as quickly as possible, but it still feels very much like tower control. There's also an interesting new addition courtesy of the footwear guru Krusty Sean, who has shut up his shoe shop in favour of flaunting freshly fried foodstuffs. By exchanging a ticket you can receive a buff that increases your experience or coins earned in online battles, as well as increasing the likelihood of grabbing the sub ability you want for your gear. The nice thing is, is that this applies to 20 battles and as far as we can tell never seems to expire, so you never have to worry that you're maybe going to waste it if you're not able to play for as long as you thought. As long as you've paid for it, those things will last. 
Nice one. You'll also want to talk to Spike's replacement, Merch, who does pretty much everything Spike did and then some. You can now save up ability chunks in order to apply a specific ability onto a specific item of clothing, meaning you're no longer constantly rolling the dice on what you want from a particular bit of gear. This is by no means a quick and easy thing to do. However, it is reliable, which is far more than can be said for the original reliance on random number generation. As far as performance goes, it's difficult to find anything to complain about. Everything just sort of works. The whole game is displayed in a gorgeous 1080p resolution for the most part, occasionally stepping down seamlessly during high pressure moments, thanks Digital Foundry, in order to maintain 60 frames per second at all times except in the square. And we did not experience one single frame drop in the entire time that we have played, and I've been through an awful lot of footage to make sure of this fact, so uh, you're welcome. The art team have done a wonderful job of making the game visually stunning without hampering performance, but we didn't fully appreciate that when we first picked it up. It was only when we went back to the original game we realised just how basic things look on the Wii U by comparison. The textures, bump mapping, lighting, the endless popping colours, it all boils down to a timeless art style much like The Wind Waker. There's also charm by the slosher load, with each character having their own unique and likeable persona. Even the new Salmonids look as terrifying and hideous as they should do for a band of murderous mistakes of evolution. <laughs> Not to sound shillish, but honestly, Splatoon 2 is pretty much everything you could possibly ask for when it comes to a sequel. It builds on everything the original setup and then some. Almost every single major issue people had with the first game has been resolved, showing that Nintendo is genuinely listening and wants to deliver the absolute best experience possible. That's why we are proud to give Splatoon 2 a 10 out of 10. I know. Believe me, we know. This is the third 10 we've given to a Switch game yet. And honestly, the only reason we're doing it is because they deserve it. Nintendo has produced an insane amount of quality lately, and we don't feel we should adjust our scoring system just because they've been doing a brilliant job. Splatoon 2 is absolutely phenomenal, and it deserves to have a phenomenal score. It maintains the freshness you'd expect and throws in countless big and small changes and additions, and every one of them is for the better. Anyone who says Nintendo can't do online should be eating their words right now. Splatoon 2 is simply just incredible. Oh, now that was a marathon of a review, and no mistake, let us know what you thought of it down there in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, then why don't you splatter that subscribe button and retrieve the delicious golden eggs inside, and be sure to check out NintendoLife.com for all sorts of lovely Nintendo-related content. Thank you again for watching. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah.